three, two, one. We are live. Hello, Mike. Hello, everyone. Hey, Kyle. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Please let us know if the video is okay. Is the audio okay? Hello, hello. Yep, everything seems fine, I believe. Hello, guys, in the chat. Rodrigo, spot on once more. <laughs> nice one. Perfect. All right. Before we start, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on new episodes. And quick introduction while we wait for everyone to join us live. In this free series, we are covering the basics of how to build iOS apps with Swift, TDD, and clean and modular architecture. And in this season, season three, we are migrating our UI implementation from UIKit to Swift UI to show how easy it can be to do it with a modular design. We can do it incrementally without breaking other modules. By the way, there's nothing wrong with UIKit. In fact, Swift UI still has many limitations and using UIKit is the way to go in many use cases. So we'll be mixing Swift UI and UIKit a lot to achieve optimal results because you gain no extra points for using pure Swift UI. Exactly. And of course, these live sessions, these free live sessions are only possible because of the students of the Essential Developer Academy. So thank you very much for your support throughout the years. Thank you. And if you want to take your dev skills to the next level and support our work, visit academy.essentialdeveloper.com. So this is how this session is going to work. We'll go fast and we'll have a quick Q&A at the end. Are we ready? I believe so. Awesome. So let's have a quick look at the new layout we are implementing with Swift UI. So this is a quiz app with two kinds of questions so far. A single answer question where you navigate to the next question automatically after selecting an answer. We implemented this screen here in the live session number one. We also have a multiple answer question type mm -hmm. where you need to select at least one option to enable the submit button that will navigate to the next question. We implemented this screen in live number two. And in this live session, we are going to implement the result screen. And we already have a UI kit version of the result screen. Here it is. But now we're going okay. to port it to Swift UI with this new layout. Make sense? Yep. So we got a title, a summary of the result, and the answers. As you can see, we can have many, many, many answers. So this can be scrollable. It's cropping here. So you can scroll mm -hmm. to see the rest of the answers. And the play again button should always be visible. So you can play again very easily. Okay? Okay. All right. Of course, we can reuse some elements from the screens we created in previous episodes. For example, the header view here is exactly the same here as well. Mm -hmm. And we can also reuse the button style we created in the previous live session. Okay, so the submit and the play again button are, yeah, they look the same. Just the text changes. Awesome. Here, the same. All right. So if we're going to reuse it, let's have a look. We got the question header. Should probably give it a more generic name now if we're going to reuse right. it in any context. Mm -hmm. Let's rename it. 
Could be a header view. Yeah. Let's say instead of title in question, it has a title and a subtitle. Mm -hmm. So a subtitle. Make sense? Yeah. And we can also move it to the helpers folder because it's going to be used in other contexts. We also got a rounded, rounded button we created in the previous life here, so we can reuse it as well. Okay, have a look. There you go. Enabled and disabled versions. Awesome. Cool. Let's run the tests. Passing, commit. Rename question header to header view, since it can be used in other contexts. All right. Now the result view has everything in it. The header, well, at least the header in the button. We still need to create the answer view. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So what kind of data do we need here? We need a title, mm -hmm. string. We need a summary string and an array of answers, formatted answers, right? Yeah. And a play again action that will be right. executed when you press the button. Mm -hmm. And we got all of this in the UI kit implementation. Let's have a look at the results view controller. So the results view controller has a title because every UI view controller has a title. It also has the summary string and the answers, which is the presentable answer type. And all this presentation logic is 100% tested. We implemented it in the first season. So we can reuse it. Yes. It's decoupled from UI kit. So we can reuse all the presentation logic we just need to render it in a Swift UI view. So I think we have everything we need to create the result view. So let's create a new Swift UI view. Result view. All right. So the data we need, a title, string. We also need a summary string mm -hmm. and the answers, which is an array of presentable answer and the play again action, which can be a closure. Yeah. Because we want this view to be agnostic about what happens when you press play again. We don't want to mix responsibilities in the views. Navigation exactly. it, will live somewhere else. Exactly. And it doesn't care where it's going to live. So it just delegates the message. But yeah, play again was pressed. That's it. So let's create here a quick preview. So title, let's say result, summary, you got, I don't know, three out of five, correct? Let's create a bunch of answers. So an answer has a question. So what is the answer to question one? Mm -hmm. You can have a correct answer and an optional wrong answer. And we can create a bunch of those so we can test the scroll as well. So one, okay. two, three, four, and five. That should be enough. And let's say some of them don't have a wrong answer, which means it's correct. So two of them. So three out of five correct. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Oh, we need, uh, we need one more then. <laughs> 
one wrong answer without should be nil, right? Well, two out of five correct. We have two wrong ones, right? Oh, I see. Yeah. So you got two out of five, correct? Two out of five, yeah. There you go. All right. So when creating Swift UI views, I like to start creating the previews first before doing the view, because then I get the fast feedback from the previews, helping me create the design. So another thing I like to do is to create a test preview that we showed in the previous episodes as well. So let's create a test result view. Uh, result test view. In the result test view will have the play again. Count as a state. So we can test the play again invocations. So play again count that starts at zero. And every time we invoke play again, it should increment by one. Thus, we can mm -hmm. test this behavior in the preview. So let's embed it in a V stack and add a new text view. Play again, count. That's a quick way of testing buttons and some extra behavior without running the app, which improves the feedback loop, makes it much faster. Make sense? Yep. Let's see. OK, let's add another version. Dark mode with a larger font size. Boom. OK, awesome. So now with the preview in place, with the test preview in place as well, we can start creating the layout. First, we need a header view, which is very similar to the other questions. So I think we can borrow. Mm -hmm. This setup. Like this. But the subtitle here, instead of a question, it's the summary. Yeah. Let's see. Boom, look at that. Let's add a spacer. So it sticks to the top. There you go. Fantastic. But we wanted to take the whole horizontal space here, right? We could embed it in a horizontal stack and add another spacer. So it takes the whole space, mm -hmm. all the horizontal space available. Make sense? The spacer will push all the content to the left here. You can even move this horizontal stack to the header view so we get this behavior everywhere. So in the header yeah, view. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. We can embed the whole thing in a horizontal stack. And we can add the spacer here. Look at this. You can see here in the preview, it takes the whole available space. That's it. So we don't need this anymore. Boom. That's it. Light and dark mode. Make sense? Yep. Now let's render the answers. So for each, answers. We got here the model. And we need to provide an ID, mm -hmm. a unique ID here, which can be the question. Because every presentable answer has a question and questions in this quiz, they are unique. You need to decide what is the unique identifier for your models. You can also make it implement 
identifiable if needed. But here we don't need mm -hmm. to do it because the question is unique. Okay, let's add text for each property. We have the question, which is this question here. Then we have the okay. correct answer, and we, we may have a wrong answer. Okay. So question, answer, and wrong answer. Of course, we may not have a wrong answer, so we need to check. And we only create the view if we have a wrong answer. Awesome. Makes sense? Yep. Let's see. All right. Okay. There it is. <laughs> we just need the styles. So the question, font, title. Nice. Mm -hmm. And the answer needs to be a little bit smaller. So font title two, there you go. The wrong answer has the same size as the correct answer, but they have different color. So foreground green for the correct answer and foreground red for the wrong answer. Almost there. Awesome. Yeah. Let's see, dark mode. Whoops, it's cropping here because there's too much content. We need to make it scrollable. And that's where we can use lists. Let's embed it in a list. It's ready to load. Boom, there you go. Look at that. And play it. scrollable content. Very nice. But as you can see, <laughs> every view is added as an independent cell in the list view. You can see a bunch of line separators for each view here. That's not what we want. We want every question and answer in a single cell. So every answer, question, and answer should be in a single cell. Yep. The so same view. we need to group these views into a container, which can be a mm -hmm. vertical stack. Make sense? Yep. And let's borrow the same style here. Yeah. Exactly. Boom. Leading zero spacing. Look at that. that. Yeah. Now every cell. Let me zoom in here. So every cell contains all the views stacked vertically. Looks good. All right. So that's that's it. If we can add some padding, there is some spacing here between the separators, mm -hmm. but only vertically. Let's do a padding vertical. All right, that's it. Beautiful. Let's also add the button rounded button it has a title play again and an action play again the closure play again mm -hmm. let's also add some padding there you go okay right let's play with the preview as you can see scrollable content and when we press play again, it's increasing the count, which proves that the button is correctly wired with the closure. 
Fantastic. We can even move the button inside the list. And the header view as well. And they are part of this scrollable content now. Mm -hmm. You can add any view to a list. And every view you add to the list is a cell in the list. But that's not what we want. We want the header and the button always fixed in place. Yeah. Make sense? Yep. Because this way the button is always visible. We can always play again. You don't need to scroll to the bottom <laughs> to play again. Exactly. Xcode got stuck. Boom, it's back. Let's test the dark mode version. With bigger font also looks nice. Also works. Yep. Make sense? Pretty cool. Yeah. And since we don't since we have only the cells now within the list, we don't even need the for each. We can iterate through the answers directly in the list view. Okay. Yeah, 32. I think this brace can go. There it is. Make sense? That's it. Yeah. Very nice. So the result is the same here. When you are iterating through a collection to render some cells in a list, you don't need a for each. Only if you are mixing views inside the list, you would use you would use the for each. Make sense? Yep. And of course, we can extract the result answer view here into a cell, mm -hmm. sub view. Mm -hmm. So extract sub view, result answer cell. Look at this. Very nice. just pass here the model <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. presentable answer model 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 yep awesome and let's move it to its own file All right. We don't even need a preview here. But if you want to see your views in isolation, we can just create a sure. simple preview. A question, a correct answer, a wrong answer. Let's see it. Yeah. And maybe you want to group it with another version that doesn't have a wrong answer. So size that fits and let's group it. Without the wrong answer. No. Mm -hmm. There you go. Awesome. You can create as many previews as you want. But the more previews you create, the slower things get. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's quite heavy still to compile those previews. All right, everything looks good. And again, you can test, interact with your views, with the test previews. And we showed how you can automate those checks as well with snapshot tests in the live number two. Mm -hmm. So let's commit, add result view. 
and that's it we are done with the view now we awesome. need to wire everything together <laughs> and we can do it in the factory starting with the test of course yep so here we have tests for the results view controller using UIKit view controllers so we want to change our tests to deal with views now mm -hmm. just like we did with the questions we need to cast the result of the factory to hosting controllers that hosts the swift ui view and here the type is a result view the one we just created of course we don't return controllers anymore we're going to return result views but this casting okay. can fail so we can return an optional and we can map over the optional controller and if there is a value we return the view Double. or the root view mm -hmm. Make sense yep if there is a value map will be executed and transform the value if there is no value it's just going to return new so let's update our tests now we need to unwrap the value that can be new with xct unwrap and if there is if, and if the value is new it's going to throw an exception and it's going to generate a failing test. It's not going to crash. It's a failing test. All right, everywhere now we may throw. So we're testing the view title, the view summary, and the view answers. build okay failing tests fantastic okay. now in the factory instead of returning a result view controller we're going to return a hosting controller with the result view so the title is the presenter title the same one used in UIKit. The mm -hmm. presentation logic is agnostic of framework, so we can reuse it. So the summary is the presenter summary, and the answers is the presentable answers. So we don't need the UIKit controller anymore. What about the play again? Awesome. Yeah, we can probably wait a bit to make sure the tests are passing first and come back to it. That's it. Let's run. Passing. Fantastic. Okay. And here we are checking only the count of answers. We could even increase the coverage by actually comparing the values within the array. Mm -hmm. As long as the presentable answer is equitable, so we can compare them for equality. But that's fine because presentable answer is a value type and values are equitable. We get the implementation for free. Let's run the test again. Passing. Awesome. Let's commit. Create result view in the Swift UI factory. Mm 
All right. But we are still injecting a an empty play again yeah. closure. <laughs> so now it's time to think about it. Who should mm -hmm. handle the play again action? Who should navigate or restart the game? We don't want this logic in the view. The view should be only responsible for rendering the given data. But we also don't want the factory to handle the play again action. We don't want navigation in the factory. The factory should only create instances. Mm -hmm. That's good separation of concerns. So another component needs to handle the play again action. Thus, since the factory is not going to do it or the view is going to do it, we need to inject this behavior into the factory. And a simple way of doing it is to inject a closure. So let's start with a test. So creates the hosting controller with play again action. Mm -hmm. So we're going to inject the play again action and we want to make sure that we are injecting this correctly in the view so we can accumulate the play again count into a variable every time this closure is invoked. It starts at zero. So we create an assertion that the play again count should start at zero after creating the view, which means this closure was not invoked. But when we call the view play again, it should be one. Mm -hmm. And if you call again, it should be two, which means you can call it many times. Make sense? Okay, yeah. So we need to inject this play again closure into the make results factory method. And it's going to be a escaping void to void function. Let's give it a default value so we don't break existing tests or clients. Mm -hmm. And we create the factory in the make SUT function. So let's pass it forward as well. So in the make SUT, we get the play again closure and we pass it to the factory. Okay. So the factory also needs a play again closure. So we can inject in the view. Awesome. So play again, escaping, void to void. Let's give it a default value so we don't break clients right now. Let's run the tests. Should fail because it's not injecting it yet. Excellent. All right, failing tests. We don't even need the presenter in this test. Let's run again. Look at that. So now we need to capture this value. As a property. Whoops. So we can inject it in the view when it's time to create the result view. Let's run the test again. Now it's passing. Fantastic. Awesome. Yep. So now we have a way of injecting a play again action into the view. Let's commit. Inject play again action into result view. Make sense so far? Yes. Straightforward right. stuff. Everything good with the life? Should be. Yeah. People are engaging. Awesome. All right. Now it's time to implement the recursive navigation. Every time you get to the end of the questions, we need to restart when you press play again. Okay. So let's go back to the factory and let's remove the default value for the play again action. So the compiler will show us where we can do it. Let's see. All right, the app delegate, our composition root here. 
So the app delegate right now it starts the game, which is just a demo game at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it starts the game. It could also restart the game. So let's move all this logic into a method. Extract method. Let's call it start new quiz. Actually, let's move it to the bottom here. So it's a private method that starts the quiz. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. Of course, the view window configuration should still be in the did finish launching with options. Mm -hmm. So start new quiz. And here, when we start new quiz, we need to create a factory and we need to inject the play again action, which could call start new quiz again. So recursively can start a new quiz. Okay. Make sense? Yeah, that should do it. So the navigation controller needs to be in the class scope. It can be a property. All right. It can even be a lazy property. Let's make it private. All right. That should do it. So every time you press play again, you start a new quiz recursively. Let's run. Yeah, let's see it in action. All right. Navigation is working. Okay. But we're still pushing the views in the navigation stack. That's mm -hmm. why we have a back button. Right. And we also have the old UI kit submit button at the top there. We'll deal with those in the next episode. We'll completely remove the navigation bar because in this new layout, there is no navigation bar. You can only go forward. You can never go back. Make sense? Mm -hmm. For now, let's just change this in the navigation router just as a demonstration. So we don't need a submit button in the navigation bar. Let's remove it. So here we just pass the completion closure. There you go. And instead of pushing view controllers into the stack, which will add the back button, we just push the view controller into the stack. We will replace the stack with a new stack. You can call set view controllers. Whoops. And we pass a new stack, which in this case will contain only the new view controller. Mm -hmm. And it's going to do it animated, of course. Make sense? Yes. Let's run. All right. No more back button. Submit. Go to the result. There's only two questions in this demo. But I can play again and I can select the wrong answers. Look at that. You can <laughs> play again and again. Pretty neat. Make sense? Yep. That's it. And if you're asking now, can we test navigation? Absolutely. We covered it in the previous episodes. And can you test the app delegate? Absolutely. Just like any other class. App delegate is just a class. You instantiate it, you invoke methods, and you check the return values or the side effects. So you can test the app delegate and the scene delegate as well. We'll cover it in a future episode of this series. At the moment, this logic here is only for demo purposes. So let's commit these changes. But let's not commit the changes in the navigation router mm -hmm. because yep. We're going to deal with it in the next episode with proper tests in place. So restart quiz when user taps play again. Whoops, play again. So that's it for this live session. We covered adding the scrollable content with the list view. and implementing the recursive navigation with the play again 
button. Now, of course, if you have a quiz randomizer, every time you press play again, you can randomize the questions and get a new quiz. Make sense? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course. So we hope these live sessions help you better develop, test, and maintain your code bases, and also help you migrate your apps to SwiftUI incrementally, if you so wish. Remember that SwiftUI is just a UI framework. There is nothing special about it, and it should be easy to replace frameworks in your code base. With a clean, modular design, frameworks are just details that you can replace easily. And again, SwiftUI still has some, well, many limitations, and mixing it with UIKit or even using only UIKit is the way to go in many cases. So you see us mixing SwiftUI and UIKit a lot to achieve optimal results. And there's a lot more to cover in this series, including how to implement and test complex navigation in pure SwiftUI without UIKit navigation controllers. So subscribe now and don't miss out on future episodes. Now let's have a quick Q&A. Gordon says ship it enthusiastically. Seems very happy with the result. Let's see. Does list automatically manage cell reuse? Yes. It uses table views behind the scenes. At the moment, at some point, it might not use it. You should not imply that it's using table view behind the scenes. At the moment, it does. Another question. Why you choose list over lazy V stack? Because with the list, we get all the styles we want, including the separators. How can we build a recursive screen that shows different elements of an array? All this by using the composable architecture framework. Not sure about that. What do you mean? Can you clarify? Yeah, like what's a recursive <laughs> screen, first of all? What do you mean about that? It shows different elements of an array. It's like a carousel? Is this what it means? Swift UI is iOS 12 plus, asks Rodrigo. Uh, is, is it 12 or 13? 13. 13. It's 13. Swift UI, iOS 13 plus. But on iOS 14, you got many more functionality, right? A lot of limitations were fixed in 14. And iOS 15 is going to make it even better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So that's it for this live. One more thing before we finish. Shout out to Harry from the UK who sent us the following message this week. Because of your free content, I went from getting rejected from 30,000 pound iOS developer positions to getting offered a 55,000 pounds senior iOS position. I 100% would love to join your next cohort. So congratulations, Harry. Look at this, double Absolutely. his salary. Went from rejections to getting offered a senior position. And that's what Just can happen. Fantastic if you take this content seriously. Don't yeah. just watch these videos, but also practice and apply what you learn. And you'll be on your way to get better opportunities like Harry. Also this week in the Academy, Chris, congratulations. He got an offer from, he says a big tech company. He was concerned about the design interviews. He studied the mentoring sessions and he got an offer. Congratulations, Chris from Canada. Congratulations to both of you guys. Amazing stuff. And by the way, we'll be waiting for you in the next iOS Lead Essentials cohort starting <laughs> next month. Absolutely.
And if you want to take your dev skills to the next level and support our work, visit academy.essentialdeveloper.com. And of course, if you enjoyed this session, like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on new live sessions. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again next time. Bye, y'all. See ya.